thank you for coming. I know the keynote was a little late, so I just wanted to give us a few minutes to settle in. But uh, some folks are still coming in, so I'll give you a minute. But um, thanks for coming. Um, so if you're here in track two, we're talking about testing. Specifically, we're talking about testing with mocks. So yay, we've got testers in the room. Exciting. Um, so I just really wanted to quickly introduce myself. My name is Sunday Mint. I am an engineering manager at SmartLogic and a podcast co-host. If you've heard my voice before, I've never spoken at a conference before, but I might have been in your headphones at some point if you listen to Elixir Wizards. Um, I'm also the DC Elixir meetup organizer. We do semi-regularly, maybe less than regular regularly meetups, uh, virtually, obviously, for the last uh, few years. Um, if you would like to speak at one of those meetups, please come talk to me. We're basically open to everyone at this point, but you know, we're DC. We have a cool logo. I mean, what are you gonna say? Um, I'm also strong emoji enthusiast. I use emojis to, de to debug my code, which is my, my thing. I love it. Um, talk to me about food any day, all day. And I'm a cat mom. I have a cat. There are cat stickers at the Smart Logic table if you so uh, w would like some cat stickers. We also have other wizard pet stickers. So that's a thing. Um, I am somewhat active on Twitter. I read lots of Twitter. I don't tweet lots of things. Um, but if you would like to connect with me, particularly if you'd like to be a, a guest on the podcast, please hit me up on Twitter. I will usually see a DM. So cool. Excited to get started. So today we're mostly going to be talking about obviously testing with mocks, but I wanted to give like a, bit, a, little, a little bit of a lay of the land um, Get, get some intro in, figure out like maybe where people are in testing, talk about how I like to break down my code when I'm talking about putting together a good test suite with mocks, um, and just sort of wrap it up on, on final thoughts, because there are some final thoughts. Um, I thought it might be nice to kind of first intro with what is mocks, because maybe not everyone has used mocks, uh, or M-O-C-K-S, mocks, has maybe never worked with a mock test. Um, so first, what is a mock? Not the library, but the what is a mock? Um, simulated entities that mimic behavior of real entities in controlled ways. So the short of it is when you are testing something and you would actually like to uh, simulate an experience that you know to be true in the real world, but you need it to consistently do a thing, and you don't want to run through all the code to make that thing happen. You can mock the experience for a consistent experience for yourself. Um, and there was this lovely little um, like side note that I want to say is that um, lots of folks in this room uh, mentioned to not use mocking as a verb. Uh, I actually think I traced the origin story behind that to a blog post that we're going to look at in a second from Jose Valim about how mock is a noun, never a verb. So it wasn't just pet peeves, everyone. It was said somewhere first. Um, so when we're talking about uh, writing a mock test, I guess you really want to talk about, uh, ask yourself why you might want to do that, and then why might you not just write like a test that sort of fakes your code to get to where you want to do. Um, so if you're writing out some long, complicated piece of code, and you really just need to test one other thing um, that doesn't have to do with all the setup that that code would normally need to go through in production, um, you might just want to say, I just want to bypass all the stuff, and I just want to test the thing I'm really trying to test. And so there might be this concept of, maybe I'll just write a fake function, a test helper, um, that is just a fake call, you know, and returns what I expect it to return in, in the case that it worked. Um, so, you know, this might work. Uh, I would, I'm not recommending you do this. This might work, though, if, you know, you're just trying to do something quickly. But the, the thing that gets unwieldy here is that as your code, your test helper diverges from your production code, you have to keep them up simultaneously and you will not have contracts that match each other over time, and we'll talk about that. So there is a better way, potentially, a concept of using a mock test that will match them better so that you won't have to keep track of those changes over time in a way that you'll lose track of. You still have to 
do some maintenance, but you know, uh, we all do. <laughs> Uh, so the history of Mux is kind of interesting. Uh, there was this blog post I mentioned earlier uh, that Jose posted on originally, I think, the Platform Attack blog, but then was moved to the Dashbit blog, about Mox and explicit contracts. Um, this came out before the Mox MOX library came out, uh, sort of running through why you might want to have a mock test uh, what you really should not do with that, talking about this like duplicate code and wanting to make sure that you were validating everything. Um, but then kind of saying like maybe you don't <laughs> want to do this ultimately unless you have a library that could keep up with these standards, uh, have behaviors that uh, define patterns and such. And then two years later, they, di they did actually release the library called Mox. So I thought that was kind of funny. If you like look back into the history of time, where something starts is, is a good indication of why something might have been needed. And so I think that maybe in other languages, um, the idea of a mock test was helpful for a lot of people um, for various reasons that we'll, that we'll talk about. Um, but it's just like a little hit, uh, history tidbit, which is cool. So Mox, if you're not familiar with the library Mox, from here on on we'll be talking about MOX, the library Mox, um, is a library that can help you define concurrent Mox in Elixir. Um, if you have ever used behavior, behavior spelled the British way with a U, and I can never sp uh, spell it the other way now, um, that is something that you would be using to mock your production code. You're defining callbacks so that you can um, set up contracts in your tests so that they, um, I, I kind of think of it as like defining a type system, but that is absolutely not it. But that's in my head, like this, this is like saying, this is the way it's supposed to behave, this is what it's supposed to look like adhere to this guy, you know? Um, and so it, it does very specifically adhere to a set of patterns that you must follow if you want it to work fluently for you. And that's the thing I think that people kind of get hung up on with mocks is that they maybe don't want to be as, ex as explicit with their code sometimes. They want to be a little more fluid. And, you know, we'll talk about this in a second, but, you know, that, that's fair. Like, <laughs> If you don't want to be super explicit with it, that's cool. Um, I really like it because of how explicit it is. It helps me think through things. It helps me organize my code. Um, and that kind of set of pattern really helps me out. Um, but so, you know, your mileage may vary on it. Um, the reason I say that there are, you know, some people like the explicit way and some people don't. There are lots of different ways to kind of come up with a mock environment. Mox, M-O-X, the library, may not, is not the end all be all. Lots of people, maybe even in this room, have been experimenting with protocols instead of behaviors. Um, maybe new libraries, I think, are on the horizon. I think somebody else is talking today maybe about another mock library. So, you know, there are options out there. I just want to say that Mox, M-O-X, was helpful for me to learn how to kind of figure out testing testing scalable code, making scalable code. Um, it was a stepping stone for me to, to help me figure out how I like to think about how I organize things. And so if you are somewhere, you know, in the beginning of learning how to reliably test your code, uh, you're running into some kind of unwieldy patterns that you would like to simplify for yourself, this may be for you. And, you know, you could learn it and maybe decide that you want to make something better, try something better, up to you. So there are a lot of use cases for and against mocks. I wanted to go over them real quick. Like I said, not the end all be all solution. Um, a few months ago, I recall at Smart Logic, we were working on a project that um, I started, I remembered using mocks on a previous project and then I said, you know, is this a good time to, should we start talking about adding mock tests? And at that point in time at where we were with our project, um, our, our tech lead or senior engineer on the project said, well, what are you really testing here? What is the point of adding a mock here? Like, th like that wasn't a, like a, a pointed question. He was actually asking me to, like, to think about it. Like, where, where would you like to insert it? Where would you, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Um, and I was just trying to get a green test suite, turns out. We all love the green. <laughs> so, you know, you want to think about, uh, are you just testing something to get an OK? like okay success tuple or are you testing something because it's actually going to help you understand your code's functionality do you just want it to say yes or do you want it to say yes because or yes and like think about what it's actually telling you 
and if that mock environment makes sense. Um, one of the places where it usually makes sense, at least for me, this is how I think about it, is anytime you're doing an external call. I don't usually want to rely, especially recently, <laughs> on systems that you think are just in place that might uh, come down one day. Not looking at you, Facebook. Um, you know, you're reaching out to an external API and you want to mock that situation. You want to mock that call, that HTTP call, um, in your test suite so that you can rely on that um, outcome when you're running your tests. Because the call is not what you're testing usually when you're talking about using a mock test. The HTTP call you test separately in however you want to test that, that form. Um, so reaching out to external APIs, great call, use mocks. Um, if you're testing something internally, like uh, testing database calls, testing how your Ecto queries are coming back, um, probably don't need it. Uh, you have that, you know, you have access to it. Again, it's internal, not external. So I wouldn't necessarily use mocks to do that. In fact, that's one of those things where you're like, are you lying to yourself, you know, kind of thing. So maybe annoy, uh, don't, don't go for it there. Um, and then the biggest thing that I mentioned earlier about how there's a little bit like the explicit contract setup. There's like a lot involved when you're setting up a mock. You have to put together a behavior. You have to make sure that there's an expectation set up and everything's adhering to this contract. It's just annoying enough that you start setting it up and then you go, do I really need to mock this? No, let me not. Or are you instead setting up a lot of test helpers, um, defining a user, creating a customer, the customer has an order that you also created, set up, set up, set up, set up, and then you test the thing? Maybe you just wanna mock the result of all of that setup. Because anything could have gone wrong in one of those other steps. If your test code looks really long and you just wanted to test one little spot, you know, mocks might be for you. So, when I was putting this talk together, I just finished watching Black Widow, and they mentioned, uh, I'm not spoiling the movie, I swear if you haven't seen this already, it's a meme. Um, there's this whole thing about how Black Widow lands in a hero pose. And she lands every time, like everybody's watching her, is what her sister says. Um, and every time I saw that, I was just like, I mean, man, she lands in that pose every time, every movie for the last 10 years. Um, and then I remembered, it's not her. It's not Scarlett Johansson who's constantly flying off of something and then landing on one knee with the arm back and the hair flip, you know? It's a, it's a stunt double who's consistently landing this thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier yesterday, I'm a figure skater. I don't consistently land anything. That's not a thing. I'd love that to be a thing. That's not my reality. And it's not Car uh, Scarlett Johansson's reality either. Stunt doubles are there to reliably do the thing that you need them to do. And that is actually quite similar to test doubles. The world might be doing things. People might be down. People can't get into their data centers, whatever. <laughs> and you can still run your tests because you made a mock of that situation. And that is, I think, the power here in test doubles and stunt doubles that you get to rely on some consistency. So. Before we get started, I will say, go ahead, install mocks, take a look at the hex docs. I cannot tell you how to set up mocks any better than they can. I maybe have done it once. So go ahead, set it up, take a look at it. Um, I, I will say every project I've been on that uses mocks, there was a little bit like of a variation in setup. So, you know, consult with your team, maybe, you know, just check to make sure that this is how you want to implement the thing. Um, and then you check it out and get started. So we're going to take a look at the test first. I'm going to have some code snippets, roughly real life example. Um, we're going to take a look at a test, and then we're going to look at the code that could lead back up to the test. So we'll come full circle. So we are looking at a test that is testing Stripe, uh, charging Stripe, not the HTTP call to Stripe, but the code that would call the HTTP call to Stripe. So in this case, I would need an order. Um, that is the thing that would be actually charged. Um, and I want to test that a 
um, the checkout process, the checkout modules function process checkout happened. Assert response okay. If you're familiar with tests, you know that assert response okay, you know, that's a decent indicator. You might want a few other indicators to check on. Um, the bulk of this test that has to do with mocks, MOX, is the expectation clause in the, in the middle. Uh, we're taking a look at a function that you would get from the Stripe API, um, and we're getting the function name, we're passing in the same parameters, and we are seeing what should come back. So okay status exceeded is what would come back. We'll take a look at the code leading up to it, of course. But what should come back in order for checkout process checkout to go ahead properly. So the alternate scenario, if I didn't have this, is I would have called the actual Stripe API, create Stripe charge function, pass in the Stripe charge ID, wait for the okay status succeeded. It would have reached out to Stripe sandbox, given me back that okay status succeeded, and then gone through. Stripe is notoriously good at being up, very, very rarely down. But it would be down when you're testing your, 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 your code, you know? That's when it would be down. So this is where we're going to start. Let's take a look at um, how that would get set up. So I was mentioning those contracts. How do you manage to make sure that your two kind of scenarios, your test scenario and your production scenario, are correct? Um, you define behaviors, um, implements, callbacks, that. Like I said, you're kind of defining types. This is why I say this is because you would actually say like, oh, is the amount of integer is the source of string. Um, this is a spot where you can define what, the, 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 define the contract, what are you expecting? So if you change it in your test or your production code, something is gonna fail. <laughs> because it's gonna be like, eh, it doesn't match my contract, I, eh, out the window. So let's take a look at the code involved. Um, I like to think about my code in a breakdown that's, this is, this is where we get into opinion, um, where I like to separate the section where you actually write the HTTP code versus where you have the code encapsulated in your, in your environment's code. So like the thing before repo, we'll get there. Um, and so I call that the application layer. Um, and then live versus test is really just where you call your code. So where you actually are calling for me the checkout function in, in my production code or where I'm calling it in test. So the service layer, this would be the HTTP call roughly. You know, create Stripe charge. This actually, you know, reaches out, does the post request, parses the response, log the error. This is what I would say is actually the, the code that you would test, however you want to test it. Like, go ahead, test this for real. The, the, whole, the whole way that this works is you want to test your layers so that they actually give you accurate information at the time in which you're, you're talking about your code. And then the application layer is a way that you can wrap your code so that no matter what your HTTP response uh, comes back with, you, you, the developer, always know what you're getting from your code. So if Stripe's uh, contract changed, if you needed amount, source, and customer was required, it's only right now, a, I think, an optional parameter. If you needed those three things all of a sudden and you didn't know that, you could blow up your code. And then, every, and then your checkout stopped working and then production team is like, why? You don't want to be them. So uh, something I found helpful in the past is actually wrapping it in a, in a layer so that you can actually say, this is the checkout function. This is the core checkout function. And it's in another module where you're wrapping your, your code around um, your HTTP call. And this way you can control your story. You can say, all right, so when that works, say, OK, whatever. And then when it doesn't, error on it. Getting back to this test, we can now see why this might work for us. Because once we're looking at the fact that we're actually testing the checkout process checkout, um, it's, it's a little more clear that because it was wrapped up here, um, that it's just a little easier to, to test without having to run through all the steps. So if you had to test all the HTTP stuff, um, test for all of the edge case scenarios, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a process checkout here. So I mentioned that on the mock setup, there is a really good way. Um, they, they do a really phenomenal job with instructions. Um, and 
I also said you want to check with your team because I've done the setup several different ways. Um, one thing that you always do have to make sure that you do is set up a way for your code to know how do I know which module to do it, do I do? Which one do I use? Do I use the, um, the, a the mock or the API? And so a common way to set it up is with your configs and your test EXS files. Um, you can go ahead and here I've outlined that I, you know, I said in my project namespace, here there's a Stripe module, and in production, it's the Stripe API. And in the test one, it's the Stripe mock. And that way it can point at the correct place. And the mocks EX file that you set up uh, defines a def mock from the mocks library that has the Stripe mock for the Stripe API. So you, you have the two things. That, to me, that's like a, a directional map that says, OK, the mock and the API, these two things are paired. This is how they work. Um, and this is the magic of mocks, basically, is that from there on, you can define behaviors in your test modules. And then it will be able to call upon the thing. Um, and the funny thing about this is that you came here for a test talk. And I really think it's more about like an organizational code opinion thing. So joke's on you. Um, but in that Dashbit or pr uh, Platform Attack um, blog post, Jose Valim mentioned that it's really not about making the code testable, but improving upon the design and like the functionality and what I think is, is really about the scalability here is I think that it's way, way easier to consider something that got wrapped. Um, and I learned this through testing with mocks, but this isn't necessarily, like you don't have to be doing mocks to, to think like this, is that you could you know, save yourself a lot of time and headache and heartache by wrapping some of your code in a way that you can control your environment. Um, I think, so I was previously a JavaScript developer. <laughs> Before I learned Elixir, Elixir was like the golden light to me once I saw it. Um, and the thing that really stuck with me with JavaScript was I just like, things went wrong all the time and I didn't know why. I never ever knew why. And I think that, I mean, Elixir obviously has great tooling and like great error messaging. And you know, the IEX session tells me everything I ever needed to know. But really, um, being able to break down this, this code in this way and control my story, as I like to say, um, is really why um, I thought that Mox was gonna be helpful for me is because once I started doing it that way, I really got a chance to figure out how I wanted to improve and, and scale and move forward, and um, I discovered that through Mox. So I turned the tables on you. I hope you can accept that. Um, and really what I want to say here is like, you know, don't take my word for it that Mox is great. It might not be the right solution for you. It might be. It might help you. It might save you a lot of time. It might change the way you architect your code. That would be awesome. Um, I just would encourage you all to check it out, try it, uh, talk to your team, see what they think. Um, you know, you don't want to ever do anything in a vacuum. <laughs> that sucks. Um, you know, just try it, do what feels natural, and you know, come back and let me know how, how it went. That would be fun. Uh, so that's, that's me, that's Max. <laughs> I just wanted to say, if you want to ch check out the resources that I used to put together this talk, they're in the, in the top. And then I wanted to thank Rose and Jeffrey here for really pushing me to, to put this talk together and also get it done on time. So thanks, guys. Um, I think I have time for questions. <laughs> It handles one particular set of testing frustrations with setting up a lot of extraneous code that I didn't want to do. We are inherently lazy as developers, and Mox makes it uh, with a little more work at the front, a lot less work in the back kind of situation. There are, you know, obviously, uh, I haven't defined how maybe I like to set up code otherwise uh, that, you know, Mox doesn't solve, but there are lots of problems out there, you know. Anything else? Anybody? I'm trying to understand like, what Mox is actually doing. Is it going to record a response or get to the bind to the response received? 
You would be defining what the response is in your behaviors and in your test environments, yeah. You can do that if you want to customize your experience, I think. So, so that, like I said, like maybe it's not for you if you want or like a different experience. What I think is really nice is um, if we're looking at this test, we can use the same mock here to test out the error case. And all we'd have to do is change it to error status boo, you know? Um, yeah, it gives you the expect block. Mm -hmm. Oh, so someone was really lazy and wanted to be more lazy. I love it. And how good is that? Because hammock is the best way to spend a lazy day. Awesome. I think I saw another. Yeah, John. It is documented in the Mox library, but also I think that the Dashbit blog post would be really good to like get a good understanding of where you want to frame your, your words. Because I said mocking literally until like last month. <laughs> uh, and it means something different, really. So yeah, 